Hello, everyone. All right. Yeah, hello, everyone. Uh, sorry, sorry about those. Uh, yep, OK, we can get your slides up. Awesome. All right, our, our next talk is from uh, Dr. Xiaoping Shen from the uh, Civil and Environmental Engineering Department at Penn State University. And he'll be talking about recurrent neural networks and, and geosciences. Thanks, David. Uh, everyone, it's, it's a pleasure to be here virtually. Uh, actually, it's the first time that I've been doing uh, a seminar during this pandemic. Uh, hope everyone's staying safe. Uh, so today, I want to talk about recurrent networks networks in geosciences. I'd like to appreciate uh, my student, current graduate student, Da Pong Fan, who did the streamflow modeling work, and Dr. Kwai Fan on the site. Um, he already graduated and is at Stanford University as a postdoc right now, and also postdoc Limping Tai, and uh, you know some un un unacknowledged people like uh, Farshid uh, and Ashutosh, who contributed to what I'm going to show in here. Um, first of all, you can go ahead and look at this GitHub uh, ripple mhpi is my as our handle um, the code is there and i'm going to spend some time today going through some of that code so if you can put it off that'd be helpful and secondly definitely uh, follow me on twitter and <laughs> uh, promoting myself but uh, yes uh, we, we, we I, I will talk about it many different things uh, related to ai machine learning hydrology on my twitter so see you there Okay, so today I will talk about the applications of recurrent neural network in hydrology. I will do a little bit code demo and walk through. And it's supposed to be a hands-on session. If you pull off the code uh, and if you have Anaconda and PyTorch installed, you can actually walk together with me uh, for the maybe second half of this talk. All right, so let's come back for a second. I am a hydrologist by training and I, uh, I often think about the mission that have been, has been given to us by the society. What does the society ask of us? What do they want us to do? Uh, certainly, there's a certain amount of tasks that we need to, need to fulfill. One is uh, assessment of future risks and future trends in hydrologic responses on climate change. What are the future extremes going to be look like? Look like? What are the future trends going to look like? Right. So, it's what's going to happen in the future, given what the data that we have? right now. And this next thing is about short-term forecast and states update, state updates. This is more about tomorrow. What's going to happen tomorrow? Am I going to have a flood here? Uh, is my house going to flood? Right? So this is short-term. Short uh, for doing that, you have to, uh, to make use of all the observations you have. And the only objective is to make better predictions for tomorrow. And we wanted to make predictions not only in at places where you have data, but also places where you don't have data. And of course, when we make a prediction, the, the world expects us to tell them not only uh, what values we expect uh, the, the prediction to be, but also how confident you are, right? So we need to provide uncertainty qualification um, in, in the forms of error bands or whatever distributions that you're providing. But also we want to enter, we want to provide information that's available or useful for other communities, for example, ecosystem communities, human systems. We want to look at not just the measured data, but also uh, evapotranspiration, which is, has a lot to do with, e with the ecosystems or agricultural systems, uh, soil moisture, deeper soil moisture, groundwater. Uh, all these things interact extensively with the other systems. So they, they also expect things from us. Um, a lot of times we are also exploring um, uh, models just for us to understand what is the relationship between X and Y, right? So this is for, for our own curiosity. And I think the, the society is funding us, uh, funding our curiosity, but they, a lot of times, maybe don't care so much about our curiosity, but care about the, the deliverables. So the case studies that I'm showing today are uh, soil moisture active passive satellite. This is a satellite driven uh, product that uh, was launched in 2015. It has a two to three day re revisit time and it senses top, soil moist top surface soil moisture. And over the years, we've gained quite uh, a lot of data over the surface of Earth. The second uh, case study is about streamflow modeling and What's been shown here is uh, 671 basins in the United States and their, their, their locations in, uh, of their stream flow gauges. But we have already expanded beyond that to, to 3,000 stations uh, over the commas. 
And we, for this application, we want to predict stream flow and we have daily data and also a company attributes uh, for these different basins. Um, because uh, Kathy has done an excellent job explaining what deep learning is. So I'm gonna really not spend too much time here. Uh, uh, of course, you, you already heard that it has hidden layers that automatically extract features, improved architecture regularization techniques, working directly with data. So a primary value proposition for the deep learning is the avoidance of expertise which is a little bit annoying to us as experts, but as I will explain later, this is really not, uh, uh, you know, we really can't leave without the expertise. Uh, at some point, they, they need to come together. There are many places where experts are very important in the workflow. Okay, so again, I'm not going to spend too much time on these um, machine learning architecture, but I believe uh, Kathy has already covered CNN in uh, very much detail. Um, but what I do want to mention with this deep learning is that um, uh, this autoencoder is kind of the epitome of, uh, of deep learning. You have a lot of information that comes in through the input layer, and then it get, that's condensed into a short, of, small amount of information that gets then unfolded into uh, the output layer, which is supposed to be uh, replicating what the input layer is given. So, what this means is that there is a process of information condensation. It allows us to, um, uh, it allows us to, uh, to um, uh, for example, if, if you're applying for a job, you, you're applying for, you're given it up a CV. So your whole life is condensed into that, that one page of CV, right? Uh, you have to think about what's important to put on the CV and what's not important to put on the CV. And uh, something's better not show up on the CV. So that is, um, what we make uh, that we make a decision how to condense make that make that information uh, condensation that uh, that is also the tool that uh, deep learning uses um, to extract the most crucial information and discard the rest of the uh, minor details right so we we let the network figure out what is important to 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 keep and what is not so important to keep right um, all right so let's to the uh, recurrent networks that we're using it's called a uh, long short-term memory lstm uh it was it was widely used in google translate uh, siri uh amazon um, uh, echo echo um, or whatever devices it, it was a, there was a time when uh the lstm was the fundamental structure underlying this but now it's kind of gradually uh, progressed by some of some of the other newer re reincarnations but nevertheless lstm has been found to be very successful for uh our uh, hydrology uh, and, uh, and uh, earth system modeling. Um, what LSTM is, it's a self learned memory system that uh, has these different gates, output gate, input gates, forget gate. And uh, the forget gate basically are a bunch of weights that can be trained to understand, okay, this is information that I need to discard, right? So when you walk into a building, walking into a seminar room, there's lots of information that comes into your eyes. If you remember every piece of information, your head's gonna explode. So we have to learn to discard a lot of information. So part of that is done by this forget gate. And the output gates decide what is important in your system to output. And then you also have the cell states and the hidden states. So these states are like state variables in your models that uh, keep certain information from time step to time step. All right. So this kind of design avoided a vanishing gradient problem that was previously prevalent with the uh, simple recurrent net networks. Uh, anyway, this kind of network is free from structural assumptions. And the setup that we have is you have a atmospheric forcings like climates, uh, uh, rainfall, temperature, uh, radiation, so you feed that, and optionally some outputs from land surface models and some uh, static attributes like soil textures, land, uh, slope, land cover, you feed that into your LSTM, you have the LSTM output something, that something doesn't have a meaning until you match it with the target. In this first case is the surface soil moisture, okay? So you then you train the system and learn how to create, recreate the, the observed surface soil moisture. And this is essentially a hydrologic model, if you look at it. It's, it's a hydrologic model, but it's completely data-driven and it doesn't have uh, any, stru any strong structural assumptions spaked in. Okay, so the, the, the first paper uh, along this line was published in 2017 by Dr. Kwai Fan from my group. Um, we looked at the soil moisture SMAP data and we spent about a year 
worth the training data to train the model and then have it produce out outputs continuously for the next year. This is a test period, and you can see this is a very good cell. Uh, it's very 10%, like it's an elite cell. You can see for this cell, uh, this blue line, which is the LSTM, it's capturing that fluctuations almost precisely, right? It's missing a little bit here, but it's very precise uh, in the test period. Uh, and it is, this is a medium pixel, medium performance pixel. You have 50% percentile in terms of the um, RMSC, okay? So here you're seeing that uh, we're capturing the major fluctuations. So you're missing some extremes here and here and there. Uh, but overall, if you compare, this shows the correlation over the continental United States. So we actually trained the whole system over the entire United States, uh, so there's thousands of pixels. Um, then uh, we have an R of higher than 0.85 in most of the uh, continental United States. And we compare it with the simpl simpler math methods, such as one layer uh, feed forward neural network, autoregressive functions and regularized linear regression, and the pixel by pixel trained models. The, the, the single one model that's created, the LST model was that was trained for the CANAS, turned out to give you the highest correlation and the lowest bias, which I'm not showing here, but the best characteristics. Uh, then an often, question, uh, often asked question for deep learning is, can you project future trends? Uh, you know, it works really well in the previous, in the current time, in the, in the training period. I mean, what about the future? We want to know future. Okay, so that's a valid question. So we tested this. We trained our model in, using three years of data. Then we tested the trend, the, the, the sense trend slope. Um, for, for the another three years, and uh, on the x-axis, that's the sense slope of a uh, in situ data. Okay, on the y-axis, that's the sense slope of the LSTM. So this is multi multi-year trend, and those are evaluated in the test period. So with the, the training data, we never saw this data in the training period. So you can see that we're doing a reasonably good job of capturing that trend. There's no trend here, and the LSTM also don't think there's any trend. There's a drying trend in these sites. And LSTM is correctly attributing, uh, predicting a drying trend there. So um, there's a little bit of fall off here for for these large trends, but it's you know if you compare with some other models, it's not doing too bad. Actually, we compared this with the Saxma uh, for for stream flow prediction problem. For, we compared LSTM predicted uh, trend with the Saxma predicted trend for 10 years projections. So we trained it in 10 years, and we compared the trend, uh, 10 year trend estimating in the next 10 years, okay? And we did this for LSTM and SAC. So the uh, x-axis is the observed trend of stream flow and the y-axis is the predicted trend. As you can see, for the high flow period, um, the correlation between these different trends is 0.37 for SACSMA and 0.41 for LSTM. For the low trends, all right, uh, the SACSMA is overestimating a lot of that trends. It has only a correlation 0.14, but uh, that trend was actually much better predicted by LSTM, which is 0.53. So actually, if you don't know this, uh, the SACSMA is the uh, operational hydrological model that's um, widely used over the United States. Okay, uh, that's been it has been used for you know two decades or more. Uh, so it's a very reliable model. But we see that okay, actually LSTM is giving you better trend projection than this uh, very uh, this very widely adopted model. Okay, so now that's the long-term projection. Doesn't seem too bad, right? So that's what about short-term forecast? So when you're doing short-term forecast, it's it's okay. It's often taken care of by uh, traditionally by a data assimilation scheme, right? So what does data assimilation data assimilation do? You have some simulation, which is the which is the model here, and you have some observations. Uh, scattered observations. When you have that observation, if you, oh my gosh, my model is off, so you correct it, uh, and then you let the model go forward, and the next time the, another data point kicks in, you absorb that data. So essentially, when you want to do forecast, you want to absorb all the data that you have um, to make prediction for tomorrow better, right? So this is typically handled by in ensemble common filtering schemes. So you have a simulation, you have observations, you uh, re resolve their differences used through this you know, K in KF. Of course, you have to consider their respective uncertainties, then you make a correction. So for deep learning, uh, the states are implicit. We don't know, we really know which states in deep learning cells are re represent to certain states. So, but we can turn the problems around. 
Okay. Uh, okay. Let me, okay, let me one say one, one thing here. Uh, there are a lot of choices you have to make when you do uh, in NKF. You have to choose what variables you want to include in the in the covariance matrix. You want to choose uh, how to solve the covariance matrix. You want to apply a proper bias correction, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. There are many choices that you have to make. But with the, with the machine learning, we now turn this problem around. Uh, we we first feed it observations, and then. Uh, in one step, we ask it to give us the correct simulation. In other words, in other words, we're dedicating the choice about how you make that correction to the deep network. Okay, to the deep network. So uh, this is actually an incredibly simple idea. So you just feed uh, the most recent observations into the network as an input. Okay, we actually tried more complicated solutions, but I really, but we haven't gotten good results. But and, and I really suspect if if you can find out manual ways to beat this guy who is basically optimal at finding out how to use information. Okay, so we because this is very different from data simulation, we call it data integration. But it's essentially we want to capture the same philosophical idea. Okay, so this is a DI scheme. So this paper was published uh, early this year that we use actually this paper was accepted on monday this week okay this stream flow prediction uh, forecast um uh, on monday this week um so um this is a nash Sutcliffe model efficiency coefficients for our stream flow model uh that's the lstm and that's without any data integration the lower panel is the ls nse nash Sutcliffe with the data integration I'm not doing time. Uh, uh, and this is something to be given us very good results. Um, in fact, uh, I plotted the, the distribution, the, the cumulative density function of NSC on like this. Okay. Uh, the red line is the with the DI. And you can see that without DI, we are already getting 0.74 on in our medium Nash. Medium Nash. Okay. That's not bad. Actually, you compare the with the Saxma, Saxma has a 0.65. And then without data integration, we get 0.74, which is not bad at all. But if you add DI, it elevates us to a Nash, you know, it's the same plot presented in a box format or CDF, right? Uh, we get a Nash cycle for 0.86. This is getting point to the point of being ridiculous because we, we've trained one data integration model for the whole continent of the United States. And that model gives us 0.86, which is very encouraging, let's just say, when that's probably never reported before at this level. Of course, you can do the same thing for soil moisture, uh, but no. Remember that uh, SMAP has a re, uh, has a revisit time of two to three days. You have these gaps in your data, so how do you handle that gap? So we figured out a way of implementing a closed loop implementation where you have uh, the observations replaces the, the model's own prediction only when uh, only when you have the observations. When you don't have the observations, uh, you just use the model's own observation, which means no new, no new information is added. So this closed loop implementation gives us, uh, this is a three day forecast RMSC. RMSC. I compared that with some of uh, one method in the literature, Dr. Koster, actually, who's the reviewer of this paper, so, uh, who, uh, who uh, graciously provided this data for comparison. And you see the overall over us, we reduced the error by 20%. And for these areas, it's, uh, the, the reduction of error is much more than 20%. So this paper was published early this year. As you can see, uh, the LSTM is really, this recurrent network is really important, is really powerful for prediction. But what about uncertainties? Uh, what about our model confidence? Uh, here's a paper under review, and it's been under review for some time. Uh, but essentially, we've trained, um, we, we've, we've tested a way of asking the network to predict the error by itself. And if you're in the business of running uncertainty quantification, this is really at the time you have to kind of wake up and look at this because we don't, we no longer have to make these assumptions about uh, what the error looks like, what are the cor all the correlation structures are, all the different things yet you have to correct uh, by hand. Now you just let the network figure out how to make that prediction. So the error, the network, besides the prediction itself, also predict um, what the the error would be, and this is what the network comes out comes up with, and compare with that that with the actual predictive error. So the the network is actually capturing the main uh, the main features of the error uh, the error distribution in space, and combine that with the technique called Monte Carlo dropout method, we come up with a a, a total uncertainty quantification 
and we call that sigma cum. That's a standard deviation of the error, of the predicted error. And this our unbiased RMSC is the actual error, the actual prediction error. And we get a correlation of 0.84. So that's very, uh, very promising. But this, this, this method obviously has many different issues and uh, you know, but uh, I think it's, 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 it's one step in the right way, let's just say. Um, Okay, so we've shown that the LSTM is very powerful and making these predictions uh, almost give you the close to optimal solutions. But what about the variables that we cannot observe directly? What about evapotranspiration? What about interaction with biogeochemistry, like for groundwater, which is very important? What about deeper soil moisture? So for these variables, we still have to rely on the process-based models because you don't have enough information, uh, observations about them, so deep learning won't work. So the first, uh, so it's, it's very important for us to, to integrate the physics with the machine learning in this aspect. So the first attempt that we're making is to uh, come up with a machine learning based algorithm to calibrate model parameters for this process based models. So we're suggesting to shift from a paradigm of parameter calibration to parameter learning. Okay, we call it FPL parameter learning. So in this framework, we have the forcings and the responses that, and then you have a network that predicts the parameters that goes into a surrogate model, which is then compared with the soil moisture or whatever target that you have. So essentially we calibrated VIC model. VIC is a very widely used hydrologic model using SMAP data and LSTM based FPL scheme. Okay, and these results, we presented some of these results in the AGU actually, we're now, because we run so many other experiments to, to, to thoroughly validate that we're make, getting this correctly. Um, so this is about to be uh, submitted very soon, but uh, so the very fresh results, first time we presented, we actually get stronger calibration results than shuffled complex evolutionary algorithms. It's almost unbelievable. And I, I couldn't believe this in, in the beginning. So you see, this is the shuffled complex, this is an objective function. And on the x-axis is the epoch. One epoch means you run the model for one pixel on average one time, one forward run, right? On the, at, the, at, the, at the minimum, actually at the minimum, we act, the FPL, the solid lines, actually generate better results than SCUA, the evolutionary algorithms, uh, which is, uh, and it, it does so with a very efficient fashion. So the SCUA takes about a thousand epochs to reach here, but Look at uh, you know at sampling density of S8, which, which but for us it means uh, take one pixel out of an eight by eight patch. That's the training data. Um, for for S8, we get to the same state in about uh, 30, 30 to forty epochs. Okay, so that right there saves you uh, you know uh, you know 20, 30 times uh, many many times fifty times more. If you sampling it denser, the denser you sample, the faster it's going to uh, converge. For SCUA, the denser you sample them, it, it doesn't affect, uh, because it treats every cell individually, it doesn't affect efficiency, right? So you still have to use a, a thousand epochs for every run. Okay? Uh, so it's much more efficient, but it all, at the same time, it gives, gives us better results, which is really surprising. And you combine that with uh, the efficiency of the surrogate model, it saves us overall four orders magnitude. Uh, normally for such a calibration job, you have to bring it on a, a supercomputer, hundreds of processors run it for two to three days. For us, we need just one GPU to train it under one hour uh, at a relatively dense uh, red, the sample density. Okay, so that's a huge contrast there and we're giving you better results, okay, better results. Um, now with that, we're able to predict uncalibrated variables such as ET. So we compared the ET with uh, this is uncalibrated, okay? It's totally not used during the training. Um, but the ET uh, for SCE, you know, you get the parameters, you run it through the ET, you get a correlation of 0.72 with the modus. With at the FPL, we get 0.79, okay? So it's actually get, giving us more physically sensible parameters. And we also tried spatial extrapolation. Okay, so this, is, this yellow box is the spatial extrapolation. You see, when you do a spatial extrapolation, this error starts to increase, whereas it's not happening with FPL, okay, with FP, which is this blue box. So it doesn't, doesn't get influenced as much. Um, well, you understand what's going on here through this, this particular figure. So the parameters that was estimated by SCE has a re, is really jumbled mess. Um, 
and uh, for for the infiltration uh, for for the for the deep learning based scheme, it actually gives you a spatial pattern, and which seems to be more spatially coherent. Of course, I'm gonna. Uh, it's 26 minutes. I still have some time. Um, there's also okay. So that's really encouraging, and we think this paper is gonna be submitted uh, maybe in a week, and this uh, it's really gonna change how people do cap parameter calibration. Okay? Um, so uh, there's a lot of work, more work you can do. I just show a couple of figures that we've uh, recently, uh, we've recently expanded to three, more, more than 3,000 basins across the US and we examined the impacts of reservoirs and diversions on the ability of LSTM to capture the stream flow. It seems like that actually LSTM will work for most of the small reservoirs, but not for the bigger reservoirs. And diversion also has an impact. We can also migrate knowledge across the continents and support modeling in sparsely gauged areas. We're getting good results in, um, by, by, by taking the knowledge of hydrology and data that bake it into the model and then migrate it to other continents like uh, China and uh, South America and, the, and to, to improve your predictions there. Um, we also got good results with stream water temperature, this stream, stream water temperature modeling we get an RMSC of point, uh, I don't know, point 0.7 something. Um, actually, a lot of the, the so this is the the, the temp water temperature in the in the in the rivers. Uh, and a lot of the model, other modeling effort that I've seen has an RMSC of 1.5 somewhere over here, right? So it's a, it's a, it's also showing very a lot of promise here. So these are all recent works. Um, but this doesn't mean that I think that the process process based models um, are at a loss because uh, they, they each have their different strengths and uh, weaknesses. For the process based models, it's built from the bottom up um, to, uh, to 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 create these uh, emergent patterns. We know what we put in. Uh, for hopefully, we know what we put into their model. Um, we can run experiments and uh, identify causal relationships that way. But there's a lot of limitations, a lot of human bias. Uh, for example, there's a study that looks at how people choose their models they use, extra hydrological models. And uh, more than half the people said they choose the model because that's what their advisor is telling them to do and it's, it's the model from their own group. Um, and parameter, ca parameter calibration is a mess as, as I've been showing you. And there's a lot of things we don't know about the physical process that, um, that doesn't get uh, written into the model. And the, or the errors compound, making it very hard to analyze. So this is so the big data machine learning has lots of strength. It's built from built up from the top down, so it's directly targeting the observations. It's very accurate. It's less biased. Okay, so it's less biased. Not saying completely unbiased, uh, but it and it has it has the potential of identifying things that we don't know because it's deep learning as you have these hidden layers that are extracting features from data without our, our guidance. Right? And it's highly 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 efficient in computation. Um, but there are also limitations. It can't observe everything. So you have to figure out how you incorporate physics with the machine learning. It may be difficult to interpret. It may not fully respect physical laws, which is a, a, a very bothering to us and doesn't really understand causal relationships. Uh, so I, I do see that there are synergies between the two and I don't see why one can replace another. I see that going, the, going into the future, we we'll, we'll see a lot of integration between physics and machine learning. Um, so hydrologic deep learning has launched, the conclusions are the hydrologic deep learning has launched a full on assault to offer a full suite of services with higher accuracy and lower cost. Okay, higher accuracy and lower cost. The only thing it cannot satisfy at the moment was to explain why. And um, you know, it's our, that's about our curiosity. That's not about the service we're to provide to the, to the society. Uh, the time series deep learning was spread over ma to many scientific domains. That's for sure. And we've already seen that happening. Um, deep learning will not replace the process based the models. On the country, there will be a class of unified models that I see will link together the process based modeling, deep learning. Um, powerful applications have emerged from hydrologic deep learning while PING, uh, physically based, physically informed neural networks, uh, it has completed its proof of concept. In the future, I see there, there might be more rows for ping, and deep learning may be deeply in, ingrained into the next generation of models for science and practical operations. So 
Uh, I wrote this part, this little piece in an editorial article in 2018, that I see that it, perhaps one day deep learning will become an inalienable component of the hydrologic discipline itself. Just like, you know, Bayesian, Bayesian inferences and, and uh, you know, numerical modeling have become part of hydrology. Uh, and I, it's about, you know, almost half an hour. Uh, I'd like to take some questions right here. Uh, I leave this, um, you know, Twitter here. I take some questions. Then going uh, after that, we will walk through the code for maybe 10 to 15 minutes and I give you do a hands-on session, right? So questions welcome. Hi, Hi Mark. Okay, so the questions. You went through DI method very quickly. Can you explain this methodology in a bit more detail? Well, um, it was really, really simple. Essentially, you provide the past observations, and it could be a variety of, of, of observations. You pass it through some kernel, and it could just be as an input item to LSTM itself, if you really uh, don't know what to do. Uh, and we actually tried to provide this QT, as QT minus one, QT minus two means the stream flow discharge from yesterday or from the day before yesterday. We've, we've supplied that as an input to the LSTM. We actually tried supplying a series of inputs through a CNN kernel to the LSTM. And we, try, we, we also messed with modifying the states, uh, but none of this uh, beats a simple old passing Q minus, Q T minus one as an input to LSTM. Okay? So that's just, uh, you know, we, uh, the, in terms of this guy's the simple, the simple method. Um, how confident are we using data-based model for any future predictions compared to with other physical data? I think I kind of answered that question in one, with one of our slides. And this is indeed a good question and we shouldn't like be blindly trusting the model, but this is, you know, we can't even do this for soil moisture because the soil moisture doesn't really have long-term, very long-term trends. But the so stream flow does, stream flow does. This is a 10 year trend. And compared with process-based models. So if you're questioning whether LSTM is doing the is doing a good job, you get to have some, you know, context, right? The reference levels. And this is beating, beating the SAXMA on all levels. And we look at other hydrologic models, the SAXMA is actually the best we found. Okay, so the best has the best long-term trend capturing capability among the models that we've uh, looked at. Um, so I think we should, we should evaluate it first. We shouldn't trust these models, these deep learning, whatever models blindly, but we should, give it a chance, evaluate it, and do what we are evaluating. Uh, we realize, recognize it's actually doing a better job than the process-based models. Uh, and we're actually trying out a few different ways to further improve that uh, multi-year trend analysis, including making it a loss function in our code. So that's, and we're seeing some results here. So this is a paper underway under construction right now. Next question, what's the uncertainty of the LSTM model compared to a physically based model? That's a very good question. Uh, um, in fact, there are, there are three components with the uh, uncertainty. Well, it's not a monolithic uh, quantity. You have, uh, you have the uh, observations which have uncertainties. So your, your, your deep data-driven model is as good as your model, right? So your, it can, the, the random part of the error cannot possibly be smaller than the random part of the error. In the in the data that that, that trained it, um, then uh, then there's also the model structural error. However, people have shown that the neural networks are universal approximators, so that kind of structural error is very small in our mind. It's very small, okay, because it can approximate any function as long as you fall out there. There's also the uh, uh, so we actually our paper we're talking about these different quantities. Uh, the the data noise. We call it data noise, but some people in the uh, computer science domain call it um, call it adiatoric uncertainty. But once you start saying adiatoric and epistemic, people are going to go mad. So I'm going to avoid that. Um, just call it data noise. Uh, the other part is with the uncertainty with your weights because you have a you don't have enough training data, so your weights are under constraint, right? Uh, that's why you have some uncertainty with your weights. And these uncertainty, that type of uncertainty, which is called epistemic in the computer science literature, can be reduced when you have more and more data, right? Uh, and we see that effects, that, that kind of uncertainty can be compressed. 
with more training data. Right? So there is actually different ways of quantifying this different parts of the error. And as we did in that paper, so one way is to have a model that predicts what the data noise is. The second part is to use Monte Carlo dropout to estimate the uncertainty associated with not having enough data. But the two are correlated, okay? Uh, that two are correlated because uh, when you have a low data quality, so you have a large noise, uh, because this model is a data-driven model, you are also going to have a higher uh, network weight uncertainty because it's like, um, I don't know what you're saying. This data is, doesn't seem as valid. The network is gonna tell you that, okay? Okay, oh, thanks, David. Um, can I ask him uh, last part of this question? I pick up a uh, can LS team forecast extreme events uh, that we're still evaluating, and uh, I think uh, keep waiting, wait, wait on this, oh, wait on this. Um, okay, I'm gonna get back to my uh, code walkthrough, and uh, if there's time in later, I'm gonna come back to these questions. Um, so go to actually, there's one thing I forgot to, to mention uh, the soil moisture forecast. We actually used it for real world purposes. We, I re, some of you guys might have heard of this, uh, there's many swarms of locusts that are harming the uh, crops in Eastern Africa and uh, Southern Asia, okay? And uh, you know, there's Professor David Hughes from Penn State is contacting us for help. So we actually started working on this right away. So we put our model to work. This is an automated system that's going to predict soil moisture and make a forecast for future days so they can better know where the soil moisture is. And that helps them identify where the locusts are because the locusts want to lay their eggs in wet soils. Okay, so we provided this to them. This is a website, you know, sign, search for uh, MHPI locust and you'll find this website. Um, you can click on any point. So this gives you predictions, uh, both in space and time and for the future and forecast. And what we noticed from this deep learning tool is that it's really, really simple. It's really ready for battle. You want to use it, make real lifetime, real world benefits. Uh, this is a very poor pixel in the, in the desert, right? Um, to, to make real world forecast, uh, it's really, um, it stands ready to help, it stands ready. So I can't imagine putting this together with under one month uh, to put this whole thing together. And uh, according to David Hughes, we are saving the food for 5 million people. So we're really happy to be in part of this. And they're the most, they're the people that's driving this. We provided whatever help we can. All right, um, let's go to um, our uh, repository. Oh, actually I should have had that, this one. And there's a structure here, so you know, if you haven't had uh, Anaconda and PyTorch set up, you can look at this environmental setup tutorial that's gonna tell you how you set them up. Uh, but the example is here. Um, uh, Xiaoping, please share your screen yes? again. What? Can you share your screen again? Okay. Oh, I did not share my screen. I'm so sorry about that. Um, all right, I spent a lot of time uh, without sharing my screen, sorry about that. Um, okay, so if you go to MHPI Hydro DL, you will find this repository. Uh, and uh, you can look at this setup tutorial to get uh, PyTorch Anaconda installed. But the example is here, it is a Jupyter Notebook, demo LSTM tutorial. I have it open already. But now, first of all, I'm gonna walk you through some of the code. Is that this is the main entrance demo LSTM tutorial. Okay, so this is the gateway, right? It calls a bunch of utilities. I'm gonna give you an overview here. Utilities like defaults.py, which defines a lot of default options and screen.py, which is a batch job support utility. Uh, and then you can look at master.py. It's a batch job interpreter. And the data coming through this script called load data. And the case we built is for soil moisture. And basically in the end, by the end of the day, you uh, prepare it in the form of X, Y, Z, right? X, Y, Z in space and time, a multidimensional array, and you make it a torch.tensor, right? And the train function in the master is a macro, is a macro batch script, which calls train.py. And there's a train model function and um, it also calls this RNNPY, which is the computational core of LSTM. I'm trying to move this away. So I'm gonna, I'm gonna dive in and show you uh, these pieces. 
All right. Uh, first of all, I've show, already shown you where this is. Uh, this is the Jupyter Notebook, which I'm gonna, not going to run it here. I'm going to run it later. And it go to uh, HydroDL. That's our package. Um, it calls defaults.py, right? It calls, it's, the default is in master. So the default.py gives you a lot of default options. For example, um, it defines what range, what training period it is, what is the target you want to do, what is the subset data that you want to do with it. V4 means we're taking one pixel out of a 4x4 patch to train it, uh, to, you know, uh, not train for too long. Uh, then, you know, mini batch size. So these are like default, conf default configurations. So we also define the model here. Um, which is this, okay? So the, opti the optimal LSTM, um, it, the, the, the default model is CUDI and an LSTM model, okay? So once you have this wrapped into a Python dictionary, uh, the, the master.py will interpret that dictionary and will link you with the right solver, okay? In this case, the CUDI and an LSTM model. So let's go into uh, the main, the main guy here, the main guy here. So this guy is the gateway, right? The gateway, it has, it calls default and it updates certain options, okay? So update, it updates uh, the target, the training period, blah, blah, blah. Then you could um, say, uh, you know, if you don't, if you don't have GPU, this is going to call the uh, CPU. Uh, if you have GPU, if CUDA is available, it's going to use that default that uh, OPT LSTM. Okay, and we'll go. We'll look at that later. If you don't have GPU, as I don't have on my laptop, then it's going to call up a CPU LSTM model, which uh, is obviously going to be slower, but it yeah, it can be run on a laptop just for demonstration purposes. Right, so you define these options, and I actually have this open already. Um, on my, this is the actually the live version, so you can you can click and run these options. Um, for example, if you click this, click and run these options, it's very fast, and click in it. The data is already wrapped in, so you can get this down, unzip it, and ready to go right from there. Just open this uh, this uh, Jupyter notebook. And this defines the options of training periods, uh, where to put save the files. And then if you train this, you see, okay, I've already run this and you can see the results here. Uh, without, the time is taking very long for each epoch because I don't have, on my laptop, I don't have a GPU and I don't have a very powerful CPU. So it's taking a lot of time. Uh, but if you have a GPU, this is probably gonna take just a couple of seconds, right? There's a huge difference and you don't wanna, you don't want to actually for real jobs. You, you do want a GPU, okay? Um, so what does it do when I call train? Let's get in, get into the code. I give you a very brief overview um, to see what the train does. Go to the master.py, and here you have a train function. So this tra train function here in the um, this master py is what my students insist that we have, uh, but. Um, it's a little bit, you know, got to wrap your head around it, but it's essentially a batch job interpreter. It, it, it's, it's easier if you work with these dictionaries and define and redefine some items and rerun it. It's, it's more convenient for them, but for new, new beginners, it's a, it's a little bit twisting. Um, so essentially what this does is it takes these uh, dictionary entries and interpret them. For example, it calls this option data and call the load data to give you, basically resolve it to, and the data frame, the X and Y, that's the target. The X is the input, C is the constant, static constants, right? And we get the shape of that, and then, then it interprets the dictionary in terms of the loss function it's, it's gonna use. Uh, then the model, it's gonna pick the right model. For example, in this case, it's gonna do this C. It's gonna define the model as CUDI and then an LST model, which we're gonna take a look at later. And the, by the end of the day, it gets these variables called x, y, c, loss function. They pass it into the train function, the, the main train function, okay? And this kind of wrapper allows my students to run batch jobs much faster. Um, but in the beginning, you have to read the code. It's a little bit bothering. I've been asking for a simpler version, which we do have, but I think people can, can understand 
this, these wrappers. And if you're going to train, what this train does is it takes x, y, and the constant and loss function, and basically it loops through here, it loops through the epochs, okay, and uh, form a mini batch. So what these codes are doing, it forms a mini batch, picks out of the data from the available data sets, from the mini batch, forward the model, okay, forward the model. So it calls the model and get the prediction and the compute the loss function here, and then do a backward, and then, and then you know, do the optimal step and zero grab. That's the things you know if you know PyTorch. Okay, then it does this for a number of epochs, and uh, we also print out the statistics as we go. So this is the um, main essence of the code, and uh, the computational core. You can look QDNN LSTM model. So this one is an LSTM model with a linear layer wrapped in front of it, a linear layer wrapped ahead of it, behind it. So you can see this self-linear is a linear layer in, at the input layer. Uh, the LSTM is a CUDI and an LSTM model. There's an output layer, and essentially in here, it caused this linear layer and caused this, this LSTM. So what is this? This is the core. Let's go to that. Um, let's go to that. So this is the CUDI and N. Uh, it calls, what it does, it, it defines these weights. Uh, the reason we are going after this QDNN because this QDNN is highly optimized uh, library, uh, highly optimized. So we, in the forward function, we're essentially expanding these data sets in the way that that this QDNN and uh, this QDNN front end wants, back end wants. Okay, this torch QDNN back end. It's highly optimized and it's way faster than our own implementation because of the, the other part, part of the reason why uh, that, that demo was slow because we're not using the QDNN uh, library. So if you, when we use, we're, when we're using QDNN in the library, we can train the whole KANOS data set, the KMOS data set, 671 sub-basins, uh, 300 epochs, 10 years of training data. We can train it within, uh, gosh, uh, I think 40 minutes or so, some, something, uh, within an hour, within an hour, okay, within an hour. So this is actually really fast if you compare with some of the uh, uh, other implementations. Okay? Within an hour, you can train the job. So it's pretty, pretty good, um, right? So all the stuff are wrappers, the all, in the end of the day, it comes in and call this QDNN RCN. All right, so let's see. Uh, here, if you open the open up the Jupyter notebook, and if you have, you have to have uh, Anaconda installed, um, and and PyTorch installed, and we also have we also need something called uh, uh, we also need something called uh, base map, which sometimes gives you an error. But we in our document we described how you solve this problem. Okay, so we run this module. This is what you get, and the test part you run it again. So you, you, you run it, if you, you train it in a certain period of time, you test in, the, in a different period of time, right? Um, after that, you can draw the statistics, you, can, you click on this, you get the statistics. Uh, there's some knob you can say, okay, if, if it's taking too long, there's a one variable you can change. You can save, change the save epoch to 10, so it's gonna save a model every 10 epoch, okay? And then during the test, you can modify this n epoch I, I made it 50, so it's gonna load the one that was saved after 50 epochs. So it's not the best one, okay? You need like about 300 epochs, but now I'm just for demonstration purposes, I'm going over the one, the, the 50 epoch one. And this is the results of God. It's, see, you see the unbiased me is 0.03. That's already not bad, which is really not bad. Um, um, this is the SMAP problem that we, the, the first 2017 paper that we showed uh, that looked at the SMAP prediction. And you can look at, there's another, this is where we use the base map. Okay, you could, you could uh, look at the, the, the maps, how the errors are distributed in time and space. You can, you can click on these and give you some uh, time series. Anyway, that's, um, that's kind of the walkthrough. And I, I know that uh, if we're in a tutorial session, I'm actually gonna go around and see how people are doing, but now we can't. Nobody calls me normally. Uh, Got to, um, okay, so I'm gonna go back to questions. Since we're now we're not able to interact, we're gonna look at the questions. Do I have time for questions? 
uh, do I still have time for questions? Yeah, yeah, we, we you can go till 1110 and then we're, we're going to take a break, a 10 minute break to. to for... Good. So we have about 10 minutes for questions. Okay? So you guys, you can go uh, go and check uh, check the tutorial. Um, it, it, everything is in this. Uh, again, search for GitHub MHPI. And this is going to show up. And then look at this environmental setup. If you don't have anything set up yet, and we have the, we detailed everything how to run this, how to run this Jupyter notebook, okay? And this, uh, you have a name here, so so follow that instructions. But for now, let me look at the questions. When do you use RNN over CNN? Okay, so LSTM stands for long short term memory. So the reason for this is it's the the way it's marketed, it's able to track long term memory. But according to our own test, it tracks about a few hundred steps. Okay, if your memory is longer than a few hundred steps, it's still not able to do it. Um, but um, but you use RNN for sequential prediction problem. Okay, so originally the STM was actually designed for, you know, the, the original applications from computer science was actually a voice, uh, text synthesis, voice synthesis, or or handwriting recognition. Right, um, so it's not just for time, but the, in hydrology, there are, have been a lot of applications to use LSTM for sequential predictions or time series predictions. So that's when you use LNN. Okay. Could you give a short view on LSTM structure? Sure. Uh, let's go all the way back. Oh, here. So uh, Chao, Chao Ping, if you're going to show slides, can you share your screen when doing so? Oh, wow. Okay. So, um, okay. Sorry, I wasn't. Uh, yeah. Does no that problem. mean I. Oh, I was actually going blind again. So <laughs> I was trying to say go to, go to GitHub. MHPI, just search for that, get in here, and uh, look at this environmental setup tutorial. I read it, it has everything described in it, okay? Um, okay, so LSTM. We can look at the equations, but essentially these are neurons, these are ma matrix multiplications, and okay? matrix multiplications that uh, this output layer uh, determines what variables are going to be output, okay? Um, I'm guessing that might be a bit, a little bit overblown to, to look at the equations here, but um, you have also have states that stores information, and there's a little bit interesting work. From, there's some interesting work from uh, uh, Frederick uh, Frederick Kranz. They look at one of the states, um, and one of the states seem to kind of mirror what. Uh, snow accumulation is doing. So even without any supervision, one of the states is look at the S. It just rise up and fall in a seasonal cycle. It looks like it's actually by itself it knows, oh gosh, if I want to predict stream flow, I need to track snow storage. And it did it has a cell to store that. Because it was, uh, you know it's a little difficult. Uh, it's, you can't you can't always visualize it. But apparently such mechanisms do exist with states. Okay. And uh, hidden is another in other states that remember things. Um, you uh, uh, these input gets in the input gets is another matrix multiplication with some weights that determines which input actually gets fit in. So our guess is if you have a, an input that doesn't really have a significance, it's gonna get a small weight, and then it's gonna pretty much get ignored, right? So I hope that answered the question, and I don't want to go fall fall into the um, I don't want to go far into the, the, the equations here. Um, how deep learning will work to predict stream flow in mountainous areas with glacier, rain, and snow regimes, assuming we have stream flow data? Uh, good question. We actually found that LSTM works better in snow dominated areas. Okay. Uh, for reasons that we, I mean, I think the reason is um, 
there's a strong seasonality. It's not as flashy. A lot of the storms are not as flashy. So you have some, and, and actually Alice Steam likes to accumulate, accumulate some stuff, okay? It, it kind of figured out that, as I said before, it needs to accumulate snow. And we look at, you know, in Dapon's paper, and this paper, if you allow me to share, um, this paper is going to be out soon, but you can read the preprint already if you look for Shen Tops, and this shows it works for me, may not work for you. So, look, look, uh, search for my name, and this here's a paper: uh, enhancing streamflow forecast and extracting insights using continent scale on short term memory networks with data integration. Uh, the sh the preprint is already out. I mean, we it's already it's out here for a long time, but the paper has just been accepted at WRR. Um, Actually, if you want to know the equations, here are the equations for the LSTM. And we looked at where does LSTM perform the best? Here, uh, actually, it's right here. Um, it seems to work really well. It seems to work better for frag high fraction snow. So if you have, have, have a high fraction of snow, the NLC is actually much better than the air, other areas where you don't have snow. Okay? So, um, and it works better for wetter areas than arid regions because for arid regions you have these flash floods which are very difficult even for data integration if you have to do di it's still not going to do it well so we showed a case in this paper for the flash flood okay in texas okay in texas is a flash flood here and even you do data integration it doesn't improve it much at all. It doesn't improve it. It, it. improves it by a little bit, but not much at all because their soil moisture has no mem impact on the flash floods, right? The, the memory has no impact. It's a one day flash. So, so those events are still kind of challenging for LSTM, but it's also challenging for the other models. Okay, so you've got to put things into context. Um, whoops, did I share my screen? Stop share. We have two more minutes. All right. Um, um, I'm slightly confused about how forecasts are done with LSTM. The inputs are atmospheric forcings, weather data, then static attributes, geophysical attributes that quantifies the, the basin. And then for depth integration, what you want to feed into it is the imp is the stream flow discharge from yesterday or the day before yesterday. We tested this. You know, you can you can take even data from 30 days ago, and that will still improve your predictions. But you can also feed it instead of uh, stream flow predictions as uh, observations. You can also feed it SMAP, soil moisture. You can also feed it leaf area index snow observations, everything. So this is a very flexible framework that allows you to do forecast, right? So we try to discharge that, but doesn't prevent other people from trying other variables, um, right? Um, is it worth using something more like into a black box, I guess, damn, than an interpretable model when it comes to earth science. I think that's a very valid uh, philosophical question. What I'm, what I'm gonna argue is that these machine learning tools allows us to extract knowledge. You can actually get knowledge and through this uh, physics guided machine learning or physically informed immersion neural networks. And that's actually becoming like a trend in applied math, okay? you can actually estimate the parameters as we've shown or estimate the physics. So there are a lot of ways you can use data to remove some of our long-standing assumptions to, um, to, to actually figure out what should be the correct structure. So that's, the two are not competing. As, as a, there's a lot of opportunity to discover science from data. That's the way I interpret this, okay? And, and, and the fact that it's not using any prior assumption is precisely an advantage that you can, you know, not make it biased. Um, what, uh, what would be the best approach in AI to minimize numeric models, quantitative errors, uh, you know, especially in data, data. So in my uh, data integration, I actually don't, don't do 
I, you know, I'm not fixing the asset simulation. We're having a new scheme all, all together. So uh, ET was Modis, ET, okay, Modis, ET. All right, that's, I think that my time is up. And uh, you can ask me questions and send me emails, no problems, we'll try to respond. Uh, we'll also have a chance to answer more questions during the panel this afternoon. So uh, that'll be at 1.20 today, uh, so uh, 1.20 p.m. Mountain Time uh, for, for, for our international viewers. So let's thank Xiaoping again, and we'll be back at 11.20 with David Hall.